It wasn't long ago that my brother Serkan was caught by a demon hiding in the shadows. It grabbed at him while he was walking home. His screams broke the stillness of the night, begging for help. And I did not help. I dared not. By the time the sun rose high into the sky, his torn body lay before the door. He had crawled all the way to our house before he finally passed. We wept for him. We prayed for him. We mourned him. But we did not lay his body to rest. It was gone before we could. There he is, even now, walking outside our home. I know he's not the only one to have risen in the past year. Mother says it's because we've forgotten our faith, because we've lost our way. I wish I believed her. That would be easier, but I know it to be untrue. I saw it in his eyes as he looked at me from the tree line. Even now I hear the rage, the rage in his voice as he calls my name from the shadows. He must know. When I saw his body, I was almost relieved I did not dare run to him that night. I did not wish to be turned by that thing. <laughs> but now, that is a fate I suppose I cannot escape. Oh, brother, I'm so sorry. Welcome back, everyone. Last time we had one of these lessons we met the first of the night horrors that have haunted humanity, a being that evolved to prey on us and to drink our blood as a source of water. Today, however, we will meet the first of another type of vampire, one that has terrified our species in a very different manner. Turns out, even the terror of being preyed upon by a stronger predator was nothing compared to the terror of becoming said predator. The story of this lineage began long ago, during the Dry Age, when a clade of parasites, closely related to leeches, found a terrible way to survive the unforgiving cold. They became endoparasites, adapting to enter and live inside the bodies of other, larger animals, especially mammals. This allowed them to travel further north, until reaching what is modernly known as Eastern Europe. It would be near the Volga River when some of the first still surviving accounts of these parasites were made, as the populations surrounding this area would begin realizing their own were being affected by a terrible disease. Both the disease and the infected would be known to these people as Upyr, a word that would eventually give place to the name Vampire itself. While earlier parasites simply took the blood they needed from their host, species that had specialized further began developing mechanisms that allowed them to better fulfill this purpose. They'd travel to the brain, where they would release a series of chemical signals to control their host, giving themselves a long-term mechanism for the obtaining of blood without risking drinking their own host dry. In essence, they would have their host hunt for blood in their stead. Despite the host remaining alive and conscious during the infection process, the parasite will dull its higher cognitive functions, making them able to act only to fulfill their most basic survival instincts. Then, the parasite will induce the release of adrenaline in order to prime their hosts to seek and take down prey, greatly increasing their aggressiveness in the process. The Upyr are known to mostly attack in the dark of the night, 
hidden by the shadows. Yet, unlike some later examples, the Upyr are not averse nor affected negatively by the light. This is merely the best time to catch prey off guard or asleep. Once the victim has been killed, the Upyr will drink their victim's blood, and the parasite will halt digestion to allow this blood to be absorbed into the host's bloodstream, hence replenishing the blood the parasite drinks on a constant basis. The parasite will also induce the accumulation of calcium around the teeth, making them pointier and more likely to draw blood. The fact that human beings cannot survive large amounts of the blood of a different animal flowing to their veins, as well as our relative vulnerability compared to other species, made us the preferred prey by the upier. In order to reproduce, the first of these parasites would induce great thirst on their host, forcing them to move towards a source of water where the parasite would release its eggs. With water already being a scarce resource, this almost ensured any eggs would have to be drunk by thirsty animals. However, as they expanded north and water became even scarcer, the eggs of the parasite began hatching inside their host with the brood tunneling through their host's flesh, feeding and growing until they could enter a new host upon contact with them, detected through the heating of the skin. Of course, a certain degree of moralizing has been used to tie infections with sinful lifestyles, as if the parasite was more likely to spread in a tavern than in a church or a homestead. Infected who had passed, before or after the infection manifested, were just as capable of transmitting the parasite, meaning unburied or poorly buried dead would be a very dangerous vector for the disease. While the external effect of the infection is minimal, the effects of malnutrition will indeed alter the host's appearance, although not to the extent seen in other parasites of the clade. Furthermore, the infection has extremely noticeable effects on behavior, producing a very uncanny effect that immediately singles out the infected as being, at the very least, wrong in the eyes of others. However, this is subtle enough that alternate explanations were sometimes possible, especially in places that have suffered from plagues or disasters. Sadly, this hesitation would only allow the infected to get close to its next victim. The degree of paranoia that was and still is caused by these attacks cannot be understated. Cures for this infection were unknown at the time of the greatest peaks in infection rate, but there have existed some ways to help the host resist infection. Traditionally, the infected have been treated with herbal remedies, such as garlic and poppy. The first of these would act as an antibiotic and antiviral agent, helping the infected's body fight off the parasite and the high amount of bacteria and virus it carried, while poppy would act as a sedative, helping, at the very least, stop the host from acting out its new impulses. However, infection would advance nonetheless. And once the infected's consciousness began fading away, family members would take to tying them or wrapping them in nets, as the limited dexterity of the infected would prevent them from breaking free. Of course, eventually, more drastic means would be required once the infection had advanced to a critical degree. The upyr would have to be neutralized by removing their head, burning their body, or otherwise damaging it to the point where the parasite could no longer control it. This would, unfortunately, kill the infected. But by this point, that would make little difference. While records made at the time point to this seeming excessive, we now understand it to have been a necessity, given the ability of many of these parasites to control even recently deceased bodies. Welcome back, everyone! We are back to our World of Vampires series. As we mentioned last time, 
the vague concept of monster that drinks blood from people at night has translated into a myriad of different beings and creatures all across the world. And now we're beginning to take a look at possibly the thing most people think of upon hearing the word vampire. Human beings turned into blood-sucking undead. The opier are early examples from our real world, when vampires were very closely tied with spiritual possession, yet still showing many signs of what would eventually be seen in modern vampires, making them a prime subject for the beginning of this type of vampires in our setting. From here, we will go forth and see a lot more recent examples of vampires, going from classic folklore to even some modern media. Of course, we will still be seeing some different kinds of non-human looking vamps along the way, so there's plenty of blood to go around. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please hit those like and subscribe buttons to let these vampires into your home as well as letting me know in the comments what kind of vampires would you like to see make their way onto the series, as well as any ideas you may have for the name of today's clade of parasites, as I haven't decided on anything yet. I know some of you wanted to see more of this series, so thanks a lot for letting me know. Big thanks too to our researchers and research associates who voted for this episode on one of our exclusive polls, you too can access these polls, have early access to our episodes and creatures, and you also get to support the channel by joining in as well. And before we go, we all have a ton of fun speculating here, but you know what you shouldn't speculate about? Your internet security. Luckily, you don't have to worry about that with today's sponsor, NordVPN. Whenever you are online, you risk your information falling into the hands of hackers. And hackers are like data vampires, which is scary. NordVPN helps protect you by changing your IP address, securing online traffic through encryption, blocking malware and trackers, warning you if your data has been compromised, and a ton more benefits, keeping those evil internet vampires at bay. So click the link in the description and get NordVPN to regain your internet security, and also support the channel in the process. Anyway, that's all for today, so thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.